So I'm talking today again about fake reviewers, uh, conflict of interest, lack of expertise, and lack of transparency. Because I found in talking with people recently that these are, these are issues with reviewers that many people are actually not aware of. So who has responsibility for reviewing the reviewers? It's many of us in this room. It's the editorial office professionals, it's the editors in chief, it's the associate editors, it's those who serve on their society publication and ethics committees, and some publishers actually have a dedicated person who deals with ethics, which can be an excellent resource for the rest of us. But we need to figure out individually at our journals who has the responsibility for identifying the ethical issues, who's going to manage the ethical issues, who's going to write the policy for those issues. And we need to discuss, to figure this out before we have a problem. And to handle these issues, we need to be aware of what they are. What could happen? We need to be vigilant looking at every paper to identify the issues. We need to be educated, and of course, COPE is our greatest resource for that. And we need to have written policies about how to handle the problems when they arise. So I'm starting with fake reviewers, and I'm, I'm going to repeat some things that Allison said. But this is an issue I think that we're finding more, and although Allison's statistic was 0.003% on issues of fake reviewers, those are in published papers. In the editorial office, theoretically, we're seeing more of those and hopefully catching them so that they never get to the publication stage. So there are two types of fake reviewers, as Allison said. There is the fabricated reviewer, where someone makes up the person, and there's the stolen identity, where it's a real person, the editor may know them, but it's a fake email address, and the author ends up being invited to review their own paper, which of course they do favorably. So in our vigilance looking for these issues, the non-institutional email address can be a red flag, but as was said from the audience, there are many legitimate reviewers who use non-institutional email addresses, so it's only a possibility. The other thing, as Allison said, when you get a, a review back in 24 hours and the, there's only this many comments and it's positive, sometimes that can be another red flag. So in our policies, what are we going to do to protect ourselves from this? One way we can do this is not allowing author-recommended reviewers, but there are also legitimate reasons for doing this. Editors don't know every topic. There are niche issues where an editor is not aware of the experts in that field, and having the author recommend these people is a legitimate resource for them. So taking that away can hurt some journals. You could also allow author-recommended reviewers, but only use those that are already in your database. You know that person, you've vetted that person, you have their correct email address. Another one is using author-suggested reviewers, but doing an internet search on them to ensure it's really that person, that they are at that institution, that that is the email address that's listed, or the, they do publish in this area, and that's the contact information for them. Now I can see in your faces, you're going, I don't have time for this. That is a problem. Um, and the other is, is, a best practice is to only use one author recommended reviewer and to use at least one editor identified reviewer for balance. Now here's a um, example from Allison's Retraction Watch blog where Biomed Central found 50 manuscripts involving fake reviewers. It was a big one. Um, the blog goes on to say most of the cases were not published because they were discovered by a manuscript editor on a final pre-publication check. The five or so that had been published will go through some sort of re-review, which may result in expressions of concern or retraction. Unfortunately, COPE does not have a flowchart on how to handle an issue when you've discovered fake reviewers. But there are two cases that have been discussed in the COPE forum, and one is 12-12, -12, and the other is 12-16. So if you were looking for um, examples of how to handle this, their um, process 
for how they investigated it and their outcomes are listed in those cases. I didn't want to just pick on Biomed Central, so I pulled some others from the Retraction Watch blog. You see Elsevier's had the problem, this Food Science Journal up there. DNA and Cell Biology has done what we've discussed, where they're actually banning non-institutional reviewers to protect themselves. Um, scholarly Kitchen Post, there's just one of the various posts that they've had on this issue. So unfortunately, although it's a small percentage, we are seeing the increase in it. The second issue that we're going to talk about is conflict of interest. And in a nutshell, conflict of interest for reviewers is anything where the reviewer is going to benefit from the acceptance or the rejection of that paper, or that they are, their review is going to be biased based upon their relationship with that author or the content of the paper. So in being vigilant about this, we need to know how our systems are helping us, our online peer review systems. Are they flagging for us if a potential reviewer is at the same institution as one of the authors? Is it flagging for all authors or only the submitting author? We need to know what our system does and what it does not do. Don't make assumptions on that. For our policies, we need to ask potential reviewers to tell us remind them that they've got to tell us about their conflicts of interest and give them examples of what those conflicts could be. And they can be different for each journal, so you need to spell that out for them. In your instructions, when someone has agreed to review, again, provide those examples and tell them again if they notice a conflict of interest to let you know. And you need to make your information transparent. Put it up on your website for everyone to see so authors, reviewers, editors, readers know what your policies are. Irene Hames, who wrote the Bible for editorial office pro professionals on managing peer review in editorial offices, helped um, wrote the COPE ethical guidelines for peer reviewers on behalf of the COPE Council in 2013. And this is an excellent resource for all of us as we create our own policies. There's language here that we can use with appropriate attribution to COPE. So here's one example. And this ex includes language such as personal, financial, intellectual, professional, political, or religious, all buzzwords to make a, a reviewer think about, do I have a conflict in, in any of these areas? Two others include, if the reviewer were working at the same institution, would be joining that institution, or is even applying for a job there, that can be a conflict of interest. If they have recently been a mentor, a mentee, a close collaborator, or a joint grant holder, that can be a conflict of interest. And it's for you, again, to decide, are these conflicts for my journal or not? And what would be the time frame for when that would be a conflict? And the bottom bullet, it's saying the reviewer should notify the journal immediately if, you just, if they discover that they have a conflict after they've already started the review. So they may have agreed to review not realizing the conflict and then discovered it later. So that's again why you want to remind them in your instructions to them to please let you know if they've got conflicts. The third issue is lacking expertise and there are two parts of this. One is lacking expertise in the content area, and the other is lacking expertise in reviewing papers. You want to make sure that you are asking the reviewers to let you know if they're lacking that expertise and to decline the review if that's the case, if they're not able to provide a thorough, high-quality review for you because of this situation. So how do we know a reviewer's level of expertise in either area? Well, again, you can do that internet search. You can check and see at their institution, is this their focus area? Are they publishing in this area? Again, not many of us have time to do this. So we need to rely on the reviewers to tell us, but we've got to ask them. We've got to tell, ask them in our reviewer invitation letters to let us know, are you truly qualified to review this paper? And the language in the um, purple band down there, again, is from the COPE guidelines saying a reviewer should only agree to review a manuscript for which they have the subject expertise 
and it goes on to say, and for which they can assess in a timely manner. We all know the difficulty of reviewers not meeting their deadlines. The last issue is lack of transparency. And again, there's two parts to this. It includes lack of transparency when you've invited a reviewer and that person agrees to review, or review but doesn't have time and they pass it off to a student or a junior in their, in their department and have them review for them. This is an issue because one, in your policy information, you should be putting out there whether or not you allow them to do this because if you are a journal who says that that uh, material is confidential, they should not be sharing it with anyone. You also want to put in your policy information and in your instructions to them that if that's the case, they need to be asking for permission before they share. And the name of the person who actually performs the review needs to be provided. If you, do, if you perform blind review, they can provide that in the editor's confidential comments. The other type of transparency is when an editor performs an anonymous review on a paper that they are handling. And so if they do this, they're giving the author the impression that two people have looked at that paper instead of just the one. So this is not considered to be ethical. Instead, an editor should, if they're going to perform the review, they need to hand it off to another editor to make the decision. And so again, from the COPE guidelines, we have language on these two issues. That a reviewer should not involve anyone else in the review of a manuscript, including junior researchers they are mentoring without first obtaining permission from the journal. And in the second bullet, if an editor is handling a manuscript and decides to provide a review of that manuscript, they need to do so transparently and not under the guise of an anonymous review. So it's very important that everyone who reviews the reviewers has the awareness and education that is required to do this. And coming to industry meetings such as this meeting from COPE, such as the ISMTE meetings that are going to be taking place in the next couple of days, are really beneficial for this. Unfortunately, it seems like many of the editors, those who are assigning and inviting the reviewers, do not have the opportunity to get this education. And so those of us who do, we need to take that back and let them know about these issues. I've trained three editors since I've written this presentation, and when I got to the part about fake reviewers, for example, none of them had any idea that, that that ever happened. There are many other resources for awareness besides the in-person meetings. We've got the COPE monthly newsletter. We've got the ISMTE and CSE discussion forums. You've got the Retraction Watch blog, the Scholarly Kitchen blog, and your publishers' blogs and newsletters and resources on ethics. And I'm sure there are many others I have not listed here. Just know where your resources are before you need them. Those who review the reviewers need to be aware, vigilant, educated, and have policies they can use to manage the ethical issues that arise during the peer review process. Those who review the reviewers are an integral to a credible, high-quality peer review process. That's all of us. Unfortunately, in our current culture, money is being taken away from the editorial office, but we cannot allow that to affect the time that we take and the knowledge and the intent in ensuring an ethical peer review process. And I'm just going to leave you with the same uh, editorial that Allison showed you because this gives me nightmares. As much as we try, as we develop our policies, we're aware, we're educated, we're vigilant, it still can get through sometimes. We can't catch everything. And this editorial does a really great job of telling that story. Although they had a policy where they only allow one author suggested reviewer, for whatever reason, the editor invited both of them and they were both fakes. And so I, I like Allison, encourage you to read this editorial. It's, it's very good. And that's it for me. Do, can I answer any questions?